Hi, welcome to Consent Conversations with Joyce and Nina, where we ask the tough questions about consent and we give viewers like you the important answers. Today, we're talking to two women who fought for the same sexual assault law in individual states. One succeeded, one didn't. We'll find out why and what you can do to change that. This video is about sexual assault. It's not recommended for children. Be guided by this warning if you experience adverse or re-traumatized reactions to sexual assault content. Thank you. I'm Joy Short, the author of Your Consent, The Key to Conquering Sexual Assault, and the founder and director of the Consent Awareness Network. I'm joined by Nina Lucas, CAN's Chief of Staff. So good to see you, Nina. Are you, uh, are you ready to take a crazy look at uh, some crazy laws? It's good to be back, Joyce. And yes, these are so crazy. It's like roller coaster crazy we're going to be going on today. So can't wait to dig in. Sure is. Today, we're going to focus on how differently states approach one type of sexual assault and what our viewers and listeners can do to change that. Eve Wiley joins us today. She's a mom to uh, three adorable kids and a licensed counselor in Texas. In 2018, she discovered that her father was not really her father. Uh, instead, the fertility doctor, Kim McMorris, who her mother had turned to for help getting pregnant, misused that opportunity in order to impregnate her with his sperm. Uh, she had identified donor 106 as her choice, not McMorris. Welcome, Eve. What an ordeal. Can you tell Thanks us for how you me. learned about McMorris's, con uh, McMorris's conduct? Uh, absolutely. You know, I think like a lot of people who have things like non-parent expected results, um, I discovered this with commercial DNA testing. Um, and that was particularly through 23andMe plus health. My, my son, he's my eldest child. He was having these unexplained medical health issues that his doctors couldn't figure out. And so what we did is we did the 23andMe plus health to gain a deeper understanding of what that genetic profile looked like. And it was when I dug into the DNA portion of it is where I found that, um, that my mother's fertility doctor is my biological father. Mm -hmm. Wow, that's incredible, Eve. Can you estimate how many children and grandchildren resulted from his deception? So right now, our number of siblings is at 13. And I, I say 13 because one of them took, they got on and had this like long username and they took their information off. Um, but you have three of his social children. And then there's 10 of us that, that we call Dr. Deceived. Um, now, as far as his grandchildren, I think that we're at 18 or 19. And you have to keep in mind that we are from a very small town. You know, my town where I grew up is 5,000 people and I have half siblings that are working in the same hospital together and their children are in the same kindergarten and they didn't know that, you know, that their kids were first cousins. You know, it also, aside from consent issues and, um, you know, accidental incest, there's a biodiversity concern with this as well that is deeper than, than the fraud itself. Absolutely. You know, since 1949, medical experiments and treatments, even your COVID vaccination, uh, requires that patients must consent. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, it describes consent as being free of any manipulation, whether by force, coercion, or deception. Uh, McMorris also, as a doctor, would have sworn an oath to conduct no impropriety and do no harm. Mm -hmm. This is Hippocratic uh, Oath. Uh, when you found out what he'd done, were the Texas authorities helpful in pursuing consequences or enforcing protections for you? In my opinion, no. I mean, there he is still practicing today. 
And as of this morning, you know, just to give a little backward context here, um, my two of my half sisters, they ended up filing a medical board complaint because he is still practicing. And what ended up happening is, is the Texas medical board said, we're going to take your license. And McMorry said, no, you're not. And he filed a lawsuit. When he filed that lawsuit, he was saying that the Texas Medical Board does not have jurisdiction because in the 2016 Sunset Bill of the Texas Medical Board, the legislator put in a bill saying that no claim that is older than seven years can be investigated. Well, this is, I'm 33 years old. They did not include a discovery rule because I found this out three years ago. I didn't find this out when I was seven years old. So what we found out today is that um, that they will uphold that statute of limitations. He will retain his license and he will still continue to practice. Wow. With zero. So now in the tech in Texas, he does not have, there's no civil course of action for victims there. Um, there's a criminal cause of action, but as of 2019 and, and there's no medical board. So we officially do not have a way to hold this man accountable for the traumatic and horrific act of fertility fraud. Wow. You know, all conduct that undermines your self-determination over your reproductive organs is a sexual assault on your body. Mm -hmm. And our laws divide uh, sexual assaults from other assaults because of the added element of defilement that sexual assaults produce. Mm -hmm. Now, your bill, which qualifies fertility fraud as a sexual assault in Texas, passed unanimously mm -hmm. in both the House and the Senate. So congratulations on really a great success. Thank how, you. Did you, how did you actually go about getting the bill introduced and passed? So when I had first um, discovered this, I made several calls to attorneys and what I kept hearing was, is it's not a crime. Um, we have found other plays. I'm like, how is this not a crime? Like this, this is medical rape, this is fraud. How is this not a crime? So I talked to a friend whose um, father-in-law was Governor Perry, and it was his daughter-in-law. She introduced me to a lobbyist, and that lobbyist and I started working. And what that looked like is I would go once a week, and I would meet with every single office. They could fill my day up, you know, 10 meetings a day. I would tell my story, and I came across Senator Huffman. And Senator Huffman, she's a former prosecutor. She heard my story. She looked at me and she said, that's a sexual assault. She drafted the language. And then I found my house author, Stephanie Click. She is a former nurse. Um, and so she really understood the ethical violation and the sexual assault violation that took place. And so that's how I went about. I just told my story to as many people who would listen. And we built a lot of momentum behind that. Um, there were a lot of articles that came out. And I think that you know, with something as intimate as infertility and anything fertility related, a lots of people, whether they were adopted, donor conceived, they struggled with infertility themselves, they know someone who struggled with infertility, a lot of people could really relate to this. And everyone came back with the same thing. How do we not have laws that exist with this? But it also brought up a lot of great conversations of why, why do we not define consent? In, in our penal codes. Why, why does our legislation not do that? We only define what consent is not. Um, and so that, that's a long way of saying that that's how I got started and found my authors for this bill. Excellent. That's so true. Um, just like all states, we don't have a correct definition of consent and it leads to problems in cases like this. And hopefully we're uh, changing that uh, pattern uh, soon, to, soon, soon to be, we hope, here in New York State. We're working hard. Hopefully we're going to see something and hopefully it'll echo through the canyons uh, of, uh, of jurisprudence uh, through, throughout the U.S. and uh, around the world. We're so, hoping. I hope so. Yeah. Fingers Next crossed. for you, um, are you continuing to address this issue in other states? Yes. So um, last year I went to Florida and I lobbied for a fertility fraud bill and that one passed unanimously as well. Um, the It was not defined as a sexual assault. So I think of the fertility fraud bills that are out there, I believe there are five now that have passed. Um, those bills, Texas is the only one that takes a very, very strong stance at saying that this is a sexual assault. My hope was that with this being Texas and 
you know, other legislators really looking, you know, oh, if Texas did it, maybe this is what we should do. But it seemed to be that there was quite a bit of opposition, unfortunately. Um, but like, for example, I'm talking with Ohio now, and that is something that, um, that we're pretty adamant about being included. Uh, Colorado has said that they want to go back and amend their bill. Um, we got Pol Colorado passed last um, session as well. So um, I'm hoping that some of these uh, other states that are that are taking a stab at it now will um, will follow suit to include that. Fantastic. Because I, I I know from a victim standpoint that when you talk to our mothers, they feel like they have been violated, and, and it is a form of sexual assault. And I think that in order for for this to be some sort of atonement and um, a satisfactory bill that that sexual assault component is very healing and validating for them in their experiences. Absolutely. And as you probably know, we're, we're about to speak also with um, uh, Liz White uh, in this segment, uh, who is trying to champion the law uh, in Indiana. And right. I know you also participated by sending uh, some correspondence to the legislature in in uh, in Indiana in order to support her efforts to do so. I did. Is there anything else that you'd like to add? Anything we didn't cover? No, I am just I am so thankful, Joyce. You in particular, you have been um, so gracious and in, in helping me uh, get this passed. I get to pass your stuff along, but you've also you've given me a language and a dialogue that I didn't have before. And I think that through your efforts, you know, I have been able to, to use your words and your guidance to be able to continue that message on, um, that it is much larger than just fertility fraud and the consent piece of this is so incredibly important. And um, if we don't teach our children about consent, um, these are the people that are gr gonna grow up and make the laws after us. And so I um, appreciate you um, and Nina so much um, in, in this mission for raising awareness and, and making changes. Well, thank you so much. You know, you're, you hit the nail on the head there. And that is that if we don't have the language for it, how do we have that dialogue? How do we have that conversation that raises right. awareness? And uh, that's, you know, the basic reason that I uh, presented my TEDx talk and, and wrote your consent, the key to conquering sexual assault so that everybody basically has the recipe book. You know, if we were building a franchise for McDonald's, right? There'd be a cookbook. Uh, and uh, so instead of flipping burgers, we're flipping laws and we need a right. recipe book. And that's what I Absolutely. hope your, your consent, the key to conquering sexual assault uh, actually becomes for people. So um, Eve, thank you so much for what you've done. Congratulations on your success. Uh, and uh, thank you also for being with us today and sharing your information with us so graciously. Thank you for having me. At a Purdue University dorm in um, West Lafayette, Indiana, a young man by the name of Donald Ward climbed in bed with a young woman who had fallen asleep in her boyfriend's dorm room in her, uh, in her boyfriend's embrace. Uh, when he got out of bed, uh, Donald Ward climbed in the bed and uh, engaged this young woman in sexual contact. Uh, she did so believing that Donald Ward was her boyfriend. Uh, just like when a fertility doctor implants imposter sperm into their victim, Ward's conduct and the conduct of all imposters does the same thing. Today, House Bill 1176 is being considered to add to the crime of rape in Indiana. But so far, unlike the legislators in Texas, the legislators in Indiana have refused to consider the implantation of imposter sperm by a doctor as a crime. House Bill 1176 passed in the House 90 to 4 in its current narrow form of the imposter using artifice, pretense, or concealment uh, in sexual conduct. And the bill has been passed forward into the Senate. You, our viewers, can help broaden this legislation because let's get real, impregnating a woman is the height of sexual conduct. Liz White, an Indiana mom and social worker, uh, counted on Donald Klein, and I refuse to call him doctor, 
to implant sperm in order to create the child that she had longed to produce. Instead of the sperm that he described he was using, he implanted imposter sperm. And like Kim McMorris in Texas, the sperm was his own. So far, through Liz's efforts and the efforts of additional donor recipients, they found that Klein fathered 90 children this way and produced 180 grandchildren. Liz is fighting to expand uh, the bill 1176 uh, in order to make the crime uh, consider the implantation of donor sperm by a fertility doctor. To intelligent folks, connecting these dots, that would seem like a slam dunk, but nope, not in Indiana. Liz White joins us today. Welcome, Liz, and thank you for joining us, and thank you for your efforts. Thank you very much. It's an uh, honor to work with you. Thank you. So now, uh, Nita, I think you had a question. Yes, yeah, so welcome, Liz. We're so excited to speak to you today. Um, before you found out about all this, did your son know that he was conceived by artificial insemination? He was. We told um, him when he was about 16 years of age, he was in biology class and they were studying blood types. And lo and behold, his blood type did not match both my husband's or my own, um, obviously. And uh, he asked a question about that. And at that point, we knew um, that he was ready to understand the impact of infertility on men. And one of the things that we did as a couple to um, conceive a child was to go through um, donor insemination. Right, I think unfortunately through DNA testing, a lot of people that didn't know that they were the result of artificial insemination and their parents perhaps didn't want them to know um, had, to, had to find out the hard way. So that made an extra imposition on these families. So now, uh, Liz, what did Klein tell you about the donor sperm that he, the sperm that he was implanting? Okay, so we went to his office. I was referred by a physician that had gone to for a year and a half for frozen sperm. And at that time, that frozen sperm was only 5%. Um, good. So Dr. Klein was the considered the best of the best. And so I went to see him and he's, his office sits directly behind one of the main hospitals here in uh, Indianapolis. And he said that he would use a donor who would be a medical resident um, as his sperm. So I was 29 years of age and I'm thinking, okay, that's a young man about 27, 28 years of age. Um, and that each time I would come to the office, I would be receiving the same resident donor that had similar physical characteristics to my husband, like dark hair, dark eyes, and we would be free of any, as we knew it back then, any contagious or serious genetic diseases. Interesting. Hmm. Uh, so he lied about the characteristics in the in the sperm that he uh, was presenting. Yes, he did. Yeah. Um, I, it, I think he also said something, I, I, I read a lot about your case, Liz, about there would only be a, a certain amount of live children born to each donor? Um, that's correct. He said he would use his donor only three times for three live births. So that's three pregnancies or some of the women had multiple pregnancies. Yeah. That's correct. Mm -hmm. And about how large is the, uh, is the city that this was conducted in? I mean, isn't there- um, Indianapolis at that time probably had 100,000 people. This was 1980, um, one. And so there was about 100,000, 150,000 including some of the suburbs that are surrounding Indianapolis. Yeah, so in actuality, you know, some of these offspring could be uh, involved in incestuous relationships unknowingly as they, as they and had romantic uh, relationships with people. Mm. Yeah. The interesting thing about Don Klein is that um, it was, he was by himself in the office. There were no assistants, no nurses, no receptionists, no, no one ever in his office. I only saw him. He would greet me in his small waiting room. Um, he was the only, he would walk me back to his exam room. And then he would offer me the drape. It was a cotton drape to put over myself as I uh, undressed. And he left the room prior to my undressing and said he would return with the, um, donor sperm. 
Interesting. And I'm thinking how gracious of a young man who's in my age group, giving a resident, giving his sperm and being so thoughtful for infertile couples, you know, that that was very kind to him. Interesting. Well, he was a doctor and of course you trusted him. I mean, you know, doctors in our society, even, even now command, um, uh, you know, above and beyond the normal amount of trust we would invest I think in. That's what, oh, sorry. I think that's what makes this case complicated along with even the other cases that are coming up in the other states is they don't um, think that this can be a doctor doing this kind of behavior. But clearly Klein fits the dynamics of an acquaintance relationship of a man using his position. He had pictures of babies on his wall in his office. He was there by himself. He asked us not never to tell anyone under the guise that people would never look at our children as our children. They always think of them as donor children. Uh, and, and that's really a fallacy. But what it did was it would it, it collectively seduced this, the environment to perpetuate this ongoing lie that um, we now have the DNA was um, children born from 1972, his first case that we know about uh, up to 1988 where he was 50 years old. And I understand that, uh, that he in fact uh, was the doctor for one of his daughters. Yes, and so in that live birth of 1972, he was at an Air Force base doing uh, his residency and one of his colleagues, another physician, um, shared that he was infertile himself and Don Klein said, I can help you with that. I'll get one of the residents um, to help impregnate your wife. And of course, uh, twin girls were born from that birth in 1972. And then following that, um, one of the uh, girls of the twins uh, was having infertility issues, uh, getting herself pregnant for the second time. So she um, said she might as well go to him because her mother has sustained the relationship with him through her just GYN. And so she trusted him and never having a clue that she was actually seeing her father, biologic father. Right. And, and it's the 19 father. or 2006, 2007. Yes. And so the father was actually impregnating his daughter with his sperm. So no, she did not receive sperm from him, but wow. she saw him for a clomidad or other issues that might have complicated her getting pregnant. But the issue was he did full breast exams. He did other things that were just not, not related at all to the fertility issue. Uh -huh. And, and it, it disgusts her to this day. It's absolutely uh, outrageous. Um, any um, decent, reasonable person <laughs> would find that to be objectionable for so many reasons. Yeah. Liz, when you found out what he'd done, did you report him to the authorities and what did they do about it? Well, that, that's an excellent question. Of course, I was uh, working in a hospital. I've always been on mental health. And of course, I right away, I reported him to the, um, to his, um, yeah. Hold on for a second, we'll put a little pause on this one, to the Attorney General Office of um, Indiana and who is responsible for the businesses and licenses. Also was in contact with a young woman, one of the daughters born uh, named Jacoba Ballard. And she was um, actually instrumental before I came on the scene, found out about it. Uh, and I got in connection with her. We did go to the prosecuting attorney's office and that was when we had a very heated discussion and the prosecuting attorney was very clear to us saying that there is no law that covers this kind of behavior that we gave consent um, by um, saying, you know, we allowed ourselves to be pregnant by the sperm and, you know, and that was, and so we read through the law and I brought the law, the current law as it stands to this day. Um, it talks a lot about forceful rapes, which is a part of rape, or it talks about child molestation and talks about drug inducement and then having assaultive behaviors. But it clearly leaves out the consent issue. And that is what his basis was. He could not charge this man, also the statute of limitations, about this behavior. And I was astounded that there was that huge of a gap in the law. Surely, because in the state of Indiana, fraud, uh, is not an issue related to consent. Uh, and that that's correct. Change. 
Uh, and um, I know that the uh, that a law did pass that made his behavior a civil crime. Uh, and uh, you know why is that not enough? Okay, that's an excellent question. Obviously, um, in the behaviors of a sexual offender, there is a fraud element, there is a lying element, there's a deception element, especially in acquaintance rape. There's um, the use of what language they use to describe that it's okay for them to do what they're doing or they really totally disrespect the person that they're with. So in this case, um, the Indiana does not understand that lying and the, the fraud part is the precursor to actually the behavior. The behavior of this man, which went passed through so many years, 35 years of his 38 practice, where he deceived women and entered their bodies with his hands, gloved or not gloved, and, and then passed his semen on. What they don't understand is that this is a man, is that he repeatedly, even though there's now 90 or 79 women that were misused by him leaving 90 births. Um, but what happens is, is that he's in this back area in another area of the office separate from the woman. He has to, to get to an erection and then go to an ejaculatory state, which means that he is using his hands to achieve that ejaculation, enter that into a vial or a test tube or a syringe and bring that back in pretty quickly to the woman that's waiting in this quiet um, private um, exam room and using the knowledge he knew that that sperm dies readily and the science will back that up. He has to get in there while his brain's still within that sexual high, that endocrine high that the dopamine and neuronephrine levels come because in the right place in the right time, that's fine. But those are the hands that are still being in the mind, being in a sexual way. And that makes the conduct, not only did he set up the fraud, but it makes up the conduct of so horrible. And the state doesn't get that as a sexual act, as a sexual assault, sexual rape. Yeah, because yeah. there is no consent. And I would not have a 42 year old man um, masturbating in the back and bringing his body, his hands to me as a 29 year old. And many of us are very young. The youngest of the women, that woman that we know of was 20 and he was 40. So that is really, that tells you the essence of the lack of remorse, the lack of minimization that are characteristic to these these offenders and he certainly has that. That's why it's important to have this bill, have that element of sexual assault. Right, and besides that, they're basic, he's basically hijacking your reproductive organs. And if that's yes. sexual, I don't know what is truly. Yeah. Uh, that was really difficult to hear, Liz, but I thank you for sharing that as a survivor and also from the perspective of a you know, mental health professional like you are. Um, and um, it, it was very gruesome to hear, but I'm glad that you told that story because I think that uh, the people out there need to understand exactly what happened, what does happen, and, you know, um, the, what is probably going through the mind of these offenders. And, um, you know, I, I just think that it was incredibly powerful for you to share that. No. Thank you. I just wanted to add that even though we now have nine, 90 known DNA children born from him, that the rate of pregnancy is not the same for all of us women. For me, it was almost six months. And that we, he had to achieve over a thousand ejaculations just to create those 90 children. Now there's 79 women. Some of them have multiple births. There's 11 twins and one set of triplets. So you think about that impact is that this is a perpetual masturbating man who uses his office and position to misuse women already suffering from the sadness of infertility, not wanting to really be there, but in respect to their husband who is infertile or has low sperm count or could have been easily in the room with some of the times that happened where he brought his own sperm in. So you're saying there's over, basically that's over a thousand sexual assaults. 
That's correct. And if you look at the research, 20% of women get pregnant in the first two months, the next 30% get pregnant in three months, the remaining 50% take up to almost six months to get pregnant. You're coming in three times each month uh, during that time that you're ovulating. That's a staggering statistic. Yes, it is. Liz, and that's, that's the, that's the a cardinal thing that differentiates um, the pedophile repetitive kind of behavior a sexual offender has. And he had it, he had it nailed to the T. Liz, do you recall the specific consequences that he suffered as a result of uh, your bringing this to light? Yes, um, he, once the attorney general notified him by letter that his business was being investigated, uh, Klein wrote on his own behalf, unsolicited by the attorney general, two letters. First one stating that he did not do this at all. And second time admitting that he did it maybe five or six or maybe 10 times at the most. And both of those letters are lies to a federal officer uh, and so what happens is those become obstruction of justice. The only charges that Indiana charged him with in a criminal courts was this obstruction of justice. But the worst part was he only got one year of probation that was suspended, $500 fine. Um, and um, that was it, that was it. And since then, you know, since it's become a civil crime, you know, there are a couple of issues around uh, about why Having a civil, uh, a civil response to this is just totally inappropriate. Uh, for one thing, in order for individuals to bring a civil action, they have to pay an attorney to do that. Uh, and uh, an attorney, even if they take the case based on, uh, based on taking a percentage of uh, what, what the case warrants at the, at the end result of the case, uh, the reality is that they're not going to even take the case unless they can see really substantial financial gains to be had. So just because a case exists doesn't mean that you're going to be able to find an attorney that can actually bring this action in a civil, in, in a civil case. Uh, the other side of it is that most of these civil cases end up in, uh, in settlement agreements. And part of that settlement agreement uh, is the signing of an NDA which basically muzzles the victim. And by doing so, they cannot be outspoken about the crime that took place. And so the offender simply goes on doing it over and over and over again, uh, because no one is any, any the wiser, uh, where a conviction for a crime uh, becomes public information and would actually put an end to the behavior. So Liz, you know, you've done such an outstanding job of fighting to uh, get this law passed in Indiana. And uh, I think that our viewers need to know that it's still very possible to expand this bill, uh, 1176, in order to include this type of sexual assault as well. Uh, and um, although it passed the House, we still have the opportunity to amend it. Uh, the bill is now in the hands of the Senate in the Corrections and Criminal Law Committee uh, that's headed by Mike Young. Uh, so uh, here's how you viewers can help. There are actually four people who you can influence with your calls uh, and emails, and we'll list them for all of you in, this, in the description of this video. Uh, there might uh, Senator Mike Young and representatives Wendy McNamara, Sharon Negel, Donna Shabley, and Sue Errington. So we need to light up their switchboards and illuminate this bill's path through the legislative process. It's not too late to add Liz's amendment. So phone calls in great numbers on the same day are the best tools for getting each lawmaker's attention. And we've selected March 10th as the day for this effort. So please make these phone calls. Make these phone calls. This is the way that uh, legislation progresses when legislators are influenced and hear from people that care about these issues. Yeah, the laws in one state can pave the way for laws in every state. 
uh, and not only throughout the United States, but all around the world. So please call and say, I stand with Liz White to demand that Bill 1176 include in implantation of imposter sperm by a fertility doctor throughout Indiana. So anything else you'd like to add, Nina? Liz, I'd just like to thank you again for your tenacity, your bravery, speaking out about your truth. It's very true that this is outrageous conduct and um, I'm so pleased that you have had the fortitude to pursue this and to lead the way and uh, pave the way into getting this put into law. You are a very brave and courageous person and I just wanted to commend you on all that. Thank Liz, you very much. Thanks again from me as well. You're welcome. It was a pleasure to have you here today. So folks, uh, if you'd like to be a guest on Consent Conversations on Air with Joyce and Nina, write to us at info at consentawareness.net. Uh, please share and subscribe to our channel and smash the notification button so you don't miss a thing. Thanks for watching and for helping to make the world a safer place. See you next time. Thank you. Thank you.